Well, uh, we're going to get started here. So cool. uh, thanks so much for joining everyone. Uh, ben, thanks so much for being our esteemed guest on this month's Close Simple webinar. We are going to be talking about out with the old, in with the new. We're kind of picking up on this TikTok trend, Ben, of like, what's in, what's out for 2024. And as I was thinking about this, and as Bill, my co-founder and I were going, what would be the best way to kind of highlight ins and outs from ops than to bring in you, uh, Ben, from Motherload Holding Company. And uh, really just excited to have a discussion today. We're going to hit, you know, I think we're going to, let's see, we're going to walk through one, two, three, four, five ins and outs for 2024. I'm with the old, in with the new. Before we do that, Ben, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, let everybody here know who you are and uh, what you do day to day. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. So I work at Motherload Holding Company, and I'm part of our IT leadership team. I've been here for a while, actually. So I, I started in actually on the operations side on title, customer service, uh, uh, helped out uh, on the escrow side. Passion's always been software development, actually, and systems and processes. So I've, I've transitioned over to the support side. And, uh, uh, and yeah, so we support a family of title insurance companies, California, Arizona, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Washington, New Mexico, Texas now also. And uh, uh, we have two nationwide divisions. And uh, we have a really cool business model where each division is given pretty much full autonomy. I mean, we, we present them with technology solutions and I promote those solutions because I believe in them and I know that it's going to make their lives easier, uh, but it's up to them. So if they opt into using a program or not, uh, I just, I love technology and, and I love software and I love efficiency. Uh, I think that's my main thing too. It's like, oh, this process could be a little bit better, you know? So, so yes. that's kind of my background and, and, uh, uh, and what I do. Constantly digging in, constantly optimizing. And I think that's uh, what gets me most excited for us to jump into our discussion today is this is not something that you just look at one time, implement a thing, and then see you later. This is something that's ongoing, and we need to be thinking about how do we continue to evolve our organizations from an operations perspective. Before we do that, just so everybody knows, I'm Paul. Uh, I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of Close Simple. And, uh, you know, we are excited to start to get into some really good webinar topics as we go throughout 2024. So out with the old, in with the new today in March, we're going to be doing a look at the market, bringing in some panelists from across the country and just kind of, you know, as we get into the busier season and a lot of the markets, you know, how are we feeling about 2024? How are things looking from a rates perspective and how's business looking? I know even across the country, January was a much higher uh, order count uh, month. Uh, than was expected. And that's maybe not everybody who's listening right now, but we're just going to be digging into it and looking at it. But today, uh, let's dive into the first topic for our ins and outs, out with the old, in with the new. And this might be obvious, Ben, and this is going to kind of build uh, the rest of our webinar today. And we're talking about in building scalable solutions into your business, out throwing more bodies at the issue, right? So uh, this is an interesting one, and I'll, I'll I'll hand it off to you in just a second. You know, over the course of the last couple of years, you know, we went really scaled up in people, and then over the past couple of years, we've been kind of like scaling back. And now, as we're thinking about 2024, the market possibly coming back a little bit. I even had a title agent tell me a week ago, like January came back a little more, you know, faster than expected. He kind of he was just saying you know, we got to figure out what we're doing before spring hits us, if this is going to be a trend, because what we don't want to do is just do the same thing we always do and, you know, scale up from a hiring perspective. So when we're thinking about this idea of scalable solutions, how I like to think about it is when you scale something, you have, you know, revenues and sort of like inbound, you know, you're making money at a rate that your cost is kind of like, you know, more incremental. And when you think about growth, it's, you know, revenues up, costs are up, you know, and we really want to make sure that as we're thinking about this next season, we are building scalable solutions. So scale, revenue going up, cost going up incrementally, not just, you know, throwing more bodies at it, if you will. So talk to me a little bit about how you think about this and how can we start to think about scale 
in our organizations. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good point, Paul, because historically, it, I think a lot that resonates with a lot of us because our business has always been cyclical, right? Even with interest rates up, I, of course, we're in a down market, but we're used to things going up and down. And, and I think a lot of times what we fall into is what you said, where we increase staffing and then we decrease staffing. And, and I, <clears throat> I think especially with the, the recent increase in interest rates, we're having to be a little bit more creative. One thing that that we're looking at doing and, and been talking about, which I, I think is a, an amazing idea, is if you have people on branches that maybe don't have a full workload right now, maybe they can start taking on work from other branches and, and you could start developing this type of maybe centralized workflow where if it's lean clearance or getting upfront documents from buyers and sellers or doing uh, auditing of, of lender figures or remote online notary or whatever, that that does a couple things for you. Now you're giving these folks full-time work so you don't have to lay off. But then when things get <clears throat> busier, you, you have this, this core group that does these tasks that are well-trained. And I think it helps on the technology side as well because it can be challenging to roll out a new product to several branches and train folks that have been doing things the same way for a long time. Sometimes you can find small groups that embrace technology, whether that's showing customers how to use a portal or how to use uh, uh, push notifications or get people into self-service. You could focus on that small group. The tools allow them to be more efficient and you're, you're making use of amazing resources you have today keeping those in-house, centralizing it into a, to a spot where, where you can really scale um, a small centralized department. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think the core of what you're hitting at is like thinking about centralized services. We don't need everybody doing everything across all our branches. And how many, exactly. how many users are you helping administer, you know, your it's, software and technology to Ben? How many, yeah, how many it, users? It, it could be a lot. So we're, we're looking at hundreds on the mother load side. Like, like close yeah. to a thousand almost. I mean, and of course it depends on a market and, and, and that kind of thing. But the other challenge is having a multi-brand approach, which is something we've talked about before. I know there's probably some some other folks on, on the call too that, that have similar situations where you have to be able to adjust to local market demands, right? And that's something that that's always been a challenge for me is putting myself in their shoes and understanding when I grew up in the title industry in California. Now I'm supporting folks outside of California and understanding what the needs are there um, and, and and allowing them to pick the tools that work the best for them. So, so yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's an interesting problem. Yeah, for sure. So centralized services, how do we like share the load across our different branches? And again, great opportunity for cross training and great opportunity for as things start to scale back up and you think about that centralized services option, I think it's really good. A couple other things we talked about as we were thinking about this, how do we give customers self-service options? How do we take some of the mm -hmm. like, you know, hey, I need this, I need the status update, things like that off of their plate. And I know you bring, you know, an interesting technology stack to the table. And, you know, as we're thinking about how do we build scalable solutions, it's a nice little segue into our second in and out that we're going to be discussing. And that's embrace technology integration and resist, you know, out is resisting change in embracing technology out resisting change. And, um, you know, I love talking to you about your approach. You kind of hinted at it a little bit earlier, but when we're thinking about providing technology to people and we're thinking about how do we get people to start using it, what are some of the ways that you do this? Because there's some title in it, title companies, real estate attorneys that are like, we're doing this, everybody does it the exact same and they, we build efficiency through consistency and doing everything you know, the same way across all our branches, across all our brands and everything. And then you have other approaches that seem to work just as well. You built this very efficient machine where you're going, hey, we have this technology stack and you kind of take it out to your branches and you go, here are some of the different things that you can use, you can pick and choose. So in your case, yeah. you're giving them autonomy with that. In other cases, other folks on the line might go, that might, they might make them kind of cringe a little bit like, what? No, like we do everything the same all the time. So talk a little bit about how you roll out new technology. How do you get your users to embrace it and you know as we think about how we can build more efficient organizations do more from an uh, operations perspective yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting because I, I mean, in a sense, I, I've heard people say it many times before, we're all salespeople, right? And and I have to sell these solutions internally to our division leaders. And I wouldn't promote something that I didn't believe in myself. Like I've been in their shoes. I've seen what it's like to be under the, the stress and, and pressure that they are on a daily basis. So when it's something like, let's just take an online portal, for instance, if I'm talking to the, the division president, I know it's going to save their staff time. And that's how they're going to need to promote it internally. So, so I'm talking about the benefits to them and then they have to talk about the benefits to their end users or agents. So, so my focus is on, uh, again, it's not the features. We know there's a lot of really cool bells and whistles, but how is this going to make your day-to-day -day life better? It's going to save after our phone calls. It's going to save weekend um, uh, phone calls. It's going to save people freaking out when you can't take the call and you can't get them the, the information that they need and it's yep. going to make them happier. And you also have to listen to their concerns. Because I think the number one pushback you get on, on technology like that is like, oh, but then they aren't going to need me anymore, right? Like, isn't that like one of the, the first things that the resistance and then it's like, well, no, you're going to be able to focus on all the other things that you need to get done and they're still going to call you. They just have another option. It's about options and freeing up time. And then on, from their perspective, once they believe, it's all about believing. And like I said, I wouldn't tell somebody about a technology product that I haven't myself used and seen successful and believe in it myself that, uh, until I get to that point and I see that there's a benefit both to our the, the community and, and at our company, our, our staff, that it's going to save them time and effort, that it's going to make their lives easier. And in turn, it's going to make our customers' lives easier. Then, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an easy sell at that point. But it has to come from from the leadership team too to promote it because we see success in some divisions where the the um, they get everybody to to use a, a particular product and then others if they're if they're not on board the escrow officers the the title department that everybody else they're, they're not going to use the the technology either so it's it's about you prefer us it's about us promoting it and talking about it and then seeing this organic growth too where. Uh, one escrow officer might say, you know, I have this great testimonial. This agent loves using our, our app or, or whatever. And then they start talking to each other about it. Because I also, that's the other thing, because I can't be in all of our branches at once. It helps. Like I can go to our branch <laughs> and talk because we did this with our, our marketing director and we promoted your product. Actually, it was great. This was a, like a month ago. And then I got a call from the sales manager and she's like, Ben, we got people using Close Simple. It's so cool. It's like, yes, we got them, you know, like it, it, it takes work, but once they believe in it, then they'll promote it internally. And it's not, you're not telling them you have to do something you don't want to do. They want to do it. It's a, it's a little bit longer, long, longer of an effort. It takes a little bit longer to get there, but you have to have them on your side. And then, and then it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. It's easy for them that they, you're, they're not resisting it. Um, it's just, it's just making their jobs easier. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, and I think a lot of times we talk about starting to think about a culture of change. And I think one of the things that you do really well in an organization as large as yours is, where you've got lots of brands and you have lots of different branches and hundreds of people actually delivering the service at the end of it, just real, <clears throat> excuse me, real quick, hit on your process for <clears throat> how you push information out from your seat to the, you know, across the organization? Because I think that'll be helpful for folks as we think about how do we how do we get change that's like on a large scale? I know there's some large agents on, on the line right now. Yeah. Well, I think what you're doing right now is great because you have your, your webinars that are recurring. We do like, for instance, on one of our products, we have a monthly webinar and, and we try to promote it, even though it's a lot of agent facing stuff, we try to promote it internally so that the, the escrow officers can see what the features are. Um, we have uh, another, so I was just talking to, to uh, Lisa, my boss the other day about another product that we want to get in front of people but we don't want to tell them, hey, you guys got to use this. That's not that's not our that's not our message. And we want to make sure everybody knows it's another tool that's available to you. So I'm just going to talk to the division presidents on our monthly call next month. I'm going to say, hey, we I got this great product for it's like a wire payee validation. You know, we got this great product. We we have a division that's been using it very successfully for a while because we have an early adopter, we got a cheerleader, somebody wanted it in their division, and then they can be our spokesperson too, because they'll be on the call yeah. too. Yeah, it, we've been using it for six months, <clears throat> it works great. And if we, can, if we can sell it to our division presidents, they'll sell it to their people. Yeah, 
That's awesome. So you're going, how do we get it? How do we get success in one place <clears throat> so that we can then start taking that out to the rest of the organization? And then you have your standard, you know, yeah. playbook for we go here and then we go here and then we go here. And then we continue to talk about that as you go forward. So love that. Know you're constantly implementing new things. What are a couple of like just quick hitter technology pieces that you see over the next few months kind of coming in and then we'll move on to our next in and out. Oh yeah, totally. And, and actually to one more thing on that, that last point, one of my favorite promotional pieces on your product too, was when I did a testimonial with one of our escrow officers, do a testimonial with somebody that's boots on the ground, does it day to day. And then just, just in that video, we, like you have somebody that's like, Oh, I don't understand what this, this close simple thing is all about. What's a pizza tracker for title. Watch Christy. She did a one minute video. She'll tell you all about it. She does the same job you do every day. So that, that, that's another really cool way. Um, so for, for us in California, remote online notaries, big, we just finally got our, our law where January 1st, we can do run <laughs> as long as you're not a California notary, which is weird, but it's progress. So <laughs> we're getting there, um, but it is cool because a lot of other states have already had this legislation. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had a lot of success in, in our other operations where it could be a seller closing, it could be a cash buyer. Uh, so, it's a, and it's a big deal, you know, like I, I was actually talking to somebody the other day and they're like, well, Ben, you know, our, our sellers coming into the office for a closing, that's, that's a big deal. Like we market to our listing agents. We, we want them in our office. We want to, to have that touch point. And it's like, oh, I get it. I totally get it. But what about when they're in the country or it's an investment property or whatever? If you're mm-hmm. already sending a, a, a person traveling to their home, a mobile notary, if you do it online, now you got a seat at the table. You got your escrow officer on the phone explaining those documents to them. And it's, it's, it's not as good as them coming in the office, but it's sure better than sending a stranger to their house. So, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? So, so that's really cool. I think we talked also about like just earnest money. It's just, it's crazy because like for the longest time, it's just been get your checkbook out and write a check. And I was talking to my boss yeah. the other day. I was like, I have a checkbook. I don't know if I would, if I was 20 years younger though, what are these people doing when they need to buy a house? I have to go get a checkbook just to, to, you know? So of course he gets in a wire, <laughs> but there's a, there's newer technology that's out there. And like, we're fighting with the, not fighting, but just trying to figure out like, what is the, the, the guideline for good funds and ACH and, you know, like how, what do we need to do to get there? Yeah. Uh, so that's a big deal. Yeah. But it's, it's coming. coming, especially West coast. And even we're seeing it across the country now on the earnest money piece kind of just depends on your process and where you kind of come into it. But we know that on the West Coast, that's a big one. So, yeah. all right, next up, out with the old, in with the new, you do, in utilizing data and analytics for decision making, out making excuses for not having data. And, <laughs> you know, most of the people on this call will probably, you're probably already there. You're like, you have good data, you know what's going on, you're starting to do some predictive analysis on like, you know, revenue next month, or you're kind of looking at, like you talked about, like load balancing, things like that. Mm-hmm. But talk a little bit about, because I know you're using some free tools, you know, most of like the title production softwares don't necessarily have, you know, a thing that's like, here's perfect reporting for you. But we know that there's options for folks. Help us get a little better at this with how you approach this, Ben. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was telling you, we use we use SSRS, which is a free reporting tool that comes bundled with Microsoft SQL Server. I think the challenge is you need somebody that can be a query writer. So, so you might need somebody with that development hat, but you could hire them. There's a lot of ways you can go online. Uh, it, it, it helps so to have like an understanding of the, the database structure. So I think the other thing I said is, We'll have, we still have a lot of people reach out to our help desk and say, hey, I need a report of every order so-and-so opened or so-and-so just just left. I need to get all their clients or whatever. So sometimes you just need to think out of the box a little bit because in a lot of those cases, I don't need a report. I go into, we happen to use Resware. I go into Resware and I say, I want every file that opened for the last 12 months where this is the escrow officer partner on the file. And then I got a whole list of files right there. And I remember like that was really how it was promoted to us when, when we were signing up for, for that TPS too, is, well, what about all of our reports? And like, oh, just use the file search tool. Oh, you can use a file search tool? That's a report. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Um, That's Power a report. BI, You're right. Yeah. Power BI is very popular right now too. Power BI. BI uh, I think there are some free versions out there. If you, as long as you're logging into their portal to run the report, uh, they they specialize in in dashboard building. Uh, you can take classes. You know, one thing that might be helpful too for everybody is just and they probably already know this, but there there's usually going to be somebody in everyone's division that is a nerd like me and Paul and wants to geek out on this kind of stuff. And they're probably ordering your payoff demands or maybe they're your receptionist. That's how I started, actually. I started out as a receptionist. And I, I remember my boss was asking me to put in um, on a 10 key, like I was just running on a, on her 10 key calculator, the revenue for the day and giving her a printout at the end of the day. And I was like, please let me put it in a spreadsheet. So <laughs> there, there, there's probably people in your division that would love to geek out on building a report and you can get them a class. I'll, I'll pay for a Udemy class for 20 bucks for a developer. He's going through a class right now because there is, um, you know, I was looking at one of his pull requests. It's like, oh, you probably want to learn more about CSS. Here's, here's a class, 20 bucks, take an hour a day, you know? And Very he's cool. already sending me messages and he's like, oh yeah, I just learned such and such. Yes, you know, so just put someone in class at Udemy at $20. There's some really good good uh, classes out there. I'm sure you have somebody in your division. Um, was it Gen Z? Look for a Gen Z year. <laughs> <laughs> Get them set up on us. Hey, you know Power some BI. of us older folks like we might want to we might want to you yeah. know nerd out on that too. But I think what's cool and like where you think about this is smart. So it's not just data around you know revenue projection or you know how many orders are open or closing or things like that. It's in the sales process. You know, you're looking yeah. at data, I think, across a lot of different layers uh, of your organization, which is really cool. So when you can actually start to connect, you know, who's opening orders? And, you know, I know there's some really interesting technology out there for, you know, syncing up with MLS data. And, okay, we can start to take yeah. that data and say, you know, how many orders do my do my clients, how many listings do they have right now? How many are they closing? You know, like, am I getting all of them? So you can really start to infuse data from the top, from the, like the sales process and then through. One of the things we've been focusing on at Close Simple is just data for how's our product actually performing? Because if we can turn it, you know, turn a, you know, dashboard around and say, this is what you're getting from us, you know what the value is. So I think even as we're looking at vendor partners, do you know what you're getting? Do you know what the value of that relationship is? And I think this is where we need to continue to go. It takes work. It takes digging in. It takes, like you said, thinking out of the box a little bit to go, what do I have access to? Um, yeah. You said Power BI. I've heard they've got some pretty good you know, connections into SoftPro. And I know a lot of the other TPSs do have this reporting available, but you kind of got to go get it. You got to yeah. prioritize it and you need to be proactive in, in how you're pursuing that data. Yeah. All right. You ready for the next one, Ben? So this yeah, one I'm going to probably get in a little bit of trouble with, but we were both at a at a uh, technology conference, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, and we were just continuing to hear about just the attacks that are coming, uh, uh, you know, at our industry. We've even seen some of the largest organizations here dealing with some of this stuff, and we know that when this organized group of fraudsters targets an industry, they start at the top and start working their way down. So. Out with, or sorry, in with, embrace, and not if, but when security posture, out, hoping and praying you won't be next. And this is not to say, and again, I don't want to get myself in trouble saying it's going to happen to you, but you have to be ready. And when you think about it and go, if something was going to happen, are we prepared to know what we would do this and then this and then this? And I think you said a really cool thing as we were talking about this, it's, are you practicing what right. your disaster recovery processes, what's your business continuity. And this is where we really got to start spending our time. It doesn't mean we don't test our people. It doesn't mean that we don't, you know, make sure that we're not looking for that phishing email and all that kind of stuff. But we really need to be thinking from an operations perspective, if this were to happen, are we prepared? So yeah. talk a little bit about that and how you're thinking about it, Ben. Yeah, uh, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we all know we had the the cyber incident that affected Fidelity over Thanksgiving, and our parent company's First American. They were just hit over over Christmas, and <clears throat> thankfully, I mean, we were on a separate network, so we were able to 
help our parent company a lot by facilitating transactions. But then it, it got us all questioning, like, well, what happened if, if our network was down? And they're asking similar questions, like, how can we um, uh, uh, be better about having a, 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 these, these backup plans uh, roll out in, in a more efficient way? Way what I what, and what I mean by that is like we talked about like sending a manual wire or issuing a, a, a check on on check stock at, at a at a typewriter. Um, that's the type of business continuity plan that we're talking about. Is what do you do when you can't get into your email? Does everybody have like a backup? I you know I don't know Gmail or whatever. Uh, those are the types of things that that you need to be talking about now and develop some sort of muscle memory. It's like <clears throat> like when we're in, in elementary school and we practice going under our desks in case there's an earthquake or a tornado, depending on what part of the country yeah. you live in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it has to be one of those things that are practiced regularly, maybe once a month, not, not once a month, once a year, where you have a checklist. Do I have the check stock? Do I know the, the process for sending a wire without having access to my TPS. Can I log into my backup email system? Can I, can it do I, we have our, our backup phone system online because our phone systems could go down. You know, those are the kinds of lessons learned that, that we've been going through since our, our last uh, um, cyber incident. And, and it's interesting too, because ever since we went into the, the software system we're in today, uh, we've been trying people to go paperless. And now after this, we're like, shoot maybe we need paper we need, files we need some yeah we need well well and you know i think that's at least until think, it closes well yeah. and you're doing this process right right now of thinking through it and i think the encouragement is this that we're doing it so we didn't lose too yeah. many participants during this okay, nobody know, so dropped again not to okay, scare good. people but the <laughs> other thing i will say is this is almost all phishing related now you know this yeah. is not like the infrastructure and the systems are pretty well intact in terms of, you know, outside parties. And they're going, it's just not worth our time anymore because there isn't a lot of security around that. I'm not saying don't, you know, be vigilant, but yeah. it's really about the phishing. So what we do, and this is something that we recommend is test your people regularly, you know, make sure you have a way to send out that spoof phishing thing. And it's a little weird the first time. It's a little bit like awkward to go, like, we're going to try to catch our employees doing something wrong. But if you get used to that, we even run contests for like who, who catches the most and Good. reports the most phishing emails. And that's the type of stuff we need to be doing on a regular basis to make sure that we continue to have, like we talked about business continuity and then making sure we're talking about it at least semi-regularly, what happens if it, if, if we're the next one. So yeah. again, a little scary, but you know, it is what yeah. it is. And we got to be talking about this and this is what we got to be, you know, thinking about as we're going forward. All right. So we got one more, Ben. We got time for it. And I think this is interesting because, you know, when you're evaluating a brand new technology, you know, you're not doing that in a vacuum. And I think the sort of last one, as we start to think about how do we get to a more scalable operation when we, as we're going into 2024, and we're thinking about new technology and we're thinking about how our security posture is and all that. And it's really, how do we start to engage the team? How do we start to engage the users early and often in the process? Ben and I happened to be in a conversation with some other agents. Uh, I think it was yesterday, actually. And one was just talking about a major software transition that they had gone through. And what she had done was actually loop her team early, early, early into the decision making process. So part of the demos, you know, and like, you know, it didn't mean that everybody was joining. But it meant that people had the option to join and understand what's happening in terms of what this decision was going to look like. So that might sound a little scary, but the in is engage your team in decision making, out is go do this. Right. And I think this is how we can really start to engage our teams <clears throat> and get their buy-in to a technology change, to a process change, to whatever, when they can kind of own the decision. So. Yeah. You know, talk a little bit about that, Ben, and the effectiveness of it. I, I absolutely agree, Paul. I, I think of it as when when we're, we're rolling out a new system, from the user's perspective, they need to know it's their system, right? Yes. It's not it's not some new software that we're putting on your desktop that you have to use. It's It's something that has been designed by them for them. And I think the most recent example we have right now is we're going through a Salesforce uh, migration. So we're trying to get Salesforce out to all of our sales team. And same thing, I, we ask each division, give us one person from your, your division that's gonna be your delegate. 
They're going to be on a committee. They're going to be part of our, our setup calls. Because if anyone's used Salesforce, you know, you get to customize the entire thing. Maybe some people have different drop downs that they want for the, the, the type of client. Is it a lender? Is it an agent? Some people want different lead conversion statuses. And, and what does it mean to take somebody from a non-directing agent to somebody that's, that's now directed their first order to the company? What do they want their dashboards to look like? And if we just put that together for them, it, may, it makes adoption. <laughs> we were talking about this. This is the very first one. It makes adoption so difficult oh, because yeah. it's not theirs. They have to have stake in the game. They have to have ownership in the product. And it has to feel like it's their product because it is. At the end of the day, we're setting it up, but then they have to live with it every single day and, and work within it every single day. And it has to make their job easier. And for that yep. to happen, they need their input at the very beginning. Yep. Yep. And I yeah. think there's a little bit of fear potentially in that saying, well, if I invite all these people, there's going to be all these opinions and all that kind of stuff. But it's like, you're going to get that. Yeah. At some point anyway, you might as well bring them in early and often. And, you know, I think, you know, that, that agent that we were talking with, I think is like 50, 60 users. This is not a small set of people that they're bringing into the conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one way, like what Ben said, you know, maybe there's an option for you to have delegates and making sure that the communication is strong between those users and everybody else. Um, but we really just want to see adoption and we want to see this culture of change so that we can start to build better, more scalable solutions in our organizations. And it's going to be the people who are executing it and adopting it. They're going to be the ones driving that. So if we can bring them in early enough and whenever we do a demo of our software, we say, just bring all the people who have the opinions, just bring them all into the room. And if we can have consensus early, there's a good chance we're going to have strong adoption later. So Ben, we're at time. <clears throat> time flies. Man. Yeah. <laughs> when you're having fun, I'm over here like half dying. I don't know. <laughs> oh man. But thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah. And uh, thanks everyone for going on a little ride with us as we're looking at the ins and outs, out with the old, in with the new, in operations, in title. We're going to follow up this webinar. We're going to send out the link. We're going to send out a one sheet that's got some of the high points, some of the notes so you've got a little Clips Notes version of this as you're thinking about how you're looking at operations in your organization. And uh, so you'll get that uh, shortly from us. And then uh, I got to just talk about our next webinar is going to be March 13th. It's actually my birthday, Ben. The next Close Simple webinar is on my awesome. birthday. So a what a great birthday way to spend your birthday. Yeah, uh, I know. What a great way to spend the birthday. And we're <laughs> going to just, we're going to be bringing in agents from across the country. Again, just looking at the market saying, um, you know, what's happening out there? How are we feeling about it? You know, getting some different opinions and things on how we're approaching the rest of the year and that sort of thing. So excited for that. March 13th, make sure you check your uh, email, sign up for that when that comes through. Um, and then if you want any more information about Close Simple, um, very easy. You can email uh, me, Paul, at closesimple.com and uh, I can get you connected here to the people that can best help you sort of uh, take a first dive uh, into Close Simple. And uh, so we would lo would love to have that conversation with you. Otherwise, I think that's it, Ben. We're ready to sign off. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. Yep. Thanks again, Ben. Have an awesome day. Uh, thank you. You too. Thanks, everyone.